And then you can see in the past decade or so, really all of the, the main players in conservation and development were kind of moving away from strictly conservation approaches or strictly development approaches to really trying to reconcile in, in the form of integrated landscape approach, but very often under a different brand. So yeah, when we, did, when we decided that we were gonna approach this in two, as two different research questions, we first tried to look at the theory around landscape approaches, how the approach has developed, how it's changed, and uh, we produced a paper earlier this year which I've tried to condense into one slide, probably not very well, but this gives a, a, the paper gives a, a lot of background, it identifies the challenges of implementation and uh, suggests ways of overcoming this. And you know, this is based on the, on the published and the gray literature. So some of the things that we found for uh, optimizing adoption of landscape approaches, the first one, evaluating progress. So the, 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 the methods that you uh, use to measure what's happening within the landscape so determining where gains or losses are being made is basically fundamental to the evaluation of landscape approaches over time. Uh, the, government the governance structures were typically the theory promoted, these hybrid structures that married this top-down authoritarian approaches with more bottom-up democratic approaches. The need for contextualization, this is something that really is abound within the literature of the, the concepts of landscape approaches. And a number of workshops that we've been at, and Peter has been at these workshops as well, where you know, the need for context is, is absolutely fundamental to a landscape approach. You can't just say that a landscape approach in one landscape is going to work equally well in another landscape. You know, we all know landscapes are different, they're dynamic, and we have to adapt accordingly. Uh, Multi-stakeholder negotiation. It's, you know, this, this also is something that's very well promoted in the literature, and it's also saying that this needs to happen from the outset. It's no good just going into landscape and saying, this is what we want to fulfill and this is what you will accept. You know, it has to be about identifying what people want and how we can bring those wants together, basically. And then finally, you need to recognize dynamic processes. We can't just kind of adds to what I said before. And also recognize that perverse outcomes can and will happen. So it's about having the, the techniques to adapt to those. And that's where the adaptive management processes come in. So then moving on to the, um, the implementation of landscape approaches. We actually found very few within the peer-reviewed literature of uh, landscape approaches within the tropics. Uh, a total number of 24 case studies, and a lot of these weren't labeled as landscape approaches, but they seem to uh, show a lot of the characteristics we would expect of a landscape approach. Encouragingly, we found a lot more from the gray literature. So 150 case studies across the tropics. Um, but a lot of these documents, you know, they're, they're non-published, and also a lot of them were pilot studies or action plans for implementation. Um, and when we were reviewing these, uh, the literature on the case studies, what became clear quite quickly is many of the documents were saying that they were where they were finding successes. Success was happening in these landscapes. Um, but when we were looking at the data, it became clear that the data wasn't particularly backing them up or the data just wasn't there. And so we produced this fairly basic table which shows the number of case studies, the number reporting success, and then on the, on the bottom row is the, the, the studies that showed reliable data. And you can see that, especially the total figures on the right here, from 174 studies, 80 were reporting success, but only 15 of those had the data to back those successes up, which is obviously concerning. However, the ones that did report success, they were reporting successful outcomes for both environment and society. And these, we've, we've graphed the, from, this is just from the peer-reviewed literature, the um, socioeconomic and environmental outcomes from these interventions. And you can see, you know, not, you can't see anymore. <laughs> so you can see they were seemingly quite successful in reconciling conservation development and producing positive impacts.
And then I think this is kind of gets a bit more interesting. So we, we looked at the factors that uh, influence these successful outcomes. And this is where it really started to occur that the reporting in the case studies was supporting what we'd already reported from the theory. So for example, the key things that were recognized as being so important for producing successful outcomes, community management or engagement, institutional support, capacity building, and good governance, these are all things that the theory literature really supported. We then looked at influence of governance structure, again, to see if what we were finding from the, uh, from the implementation was supporting the theory. And again, it seems to do a pretty good job that most commonly successful is the, the mixed approaches to governance within the landscape. But another interesting finding that's kind of not shown on this graph, but it, it is there, is the fact that you can see the, the, the axis on the left is successful, not determined, ongoing. There is no category for unsuccessful landscape approaches. And again, I think this is a real concern. Like, <laughs> what, they're working all the time. I don't think that's the case. So we need to know, if, obviously, if it's working all the time, why are we here? It's, we've, we've done the job. So we really need to know what's happening with these ones that aren't working, because obviously, that's a huge wealth of knowledge right there. So these are the key findings from the case study material. Um, current barriers to effective implementation. There's a perception that we're possibly dealing with time lags here. Um, actually, the conceptualization of landscape approach is an, on, is, is an ongoing process. And therefore, implementing agencies are actually not committing to implementation until the theory is solid. Um, the proliferation of terms, that's something I mentioned earlier. So over 80 terms alluding to a landscape approach is probably not very helpful for people that don't work in this sector. And, that might be impeding policy and practice. Uh, operating silos continue to persist at all levels. And this is from policy, where you have separate ministries with different mandates. Within research, where social scientists and natural scientists, for whatever reason, don't want to collaborate. And at practice level as well. And then engaging multiple stakeholders is all too often seen as a box ticking exercise. So there's a really nice quote from one of the papers that says, um, attendance can't be considered a good enough proxy for engagement. So just because you're having these multi-stakeholder meetings and you've got 80 people there, if only the same three people are talking every time, then you're not really engaging uh, enough people. And finally, monitoring remains the least well-developed area of landscape approach application. So there are tools being developed, and there's quite a good body of literature on, on tools, but there's nothing that's really kind of jumped out as a gold standard for how to monitor a landscape approach. So this is things we need to continue to work on and, and collaborate our efforts. Some conclusions and recommendations. Landscape approaches remain contentious and under-theorized. I think you know, there, is, there is truth in that, but I think there's enough now, and that's kind of a lead into the, to the topic of this session. There's enough theory out there now that we can start the implementation process and really you know, try to work with what we have. Because it is a trial and error process at the end of the day. And that's the adaptive management. We need to trial it, see what's working, and then we can adapt over time. There's good evidence of landscape approaches being implemented within the tropics. But as you've seen from our review, weak evidence of the effectiveness so far. Multi-level engagement seems fundamental. That's clear from both the theory and the case studies. And attempts to implement must be contextualized. As I said already, metrics need to be developed further. And I just put this slide up there because we're, these are some of the uh, research topics that we're currently working on. And you know, we, we acknowledge that this has to be a collaborative process. And we're very keen to hear from anybody that's working on similar things or is interested in working on similar things. Please get in touch because uh, we're not going to be able to do it alone, for sure. Thank you. Thanks, James, for opening up the discussion. I think there was some rich material in there, opening up a lot of questions. And that's why we're here. How do we talk about those questions that he opened up, really, at the end of his, his uh, presentation? Please hold any questions you have. Please write them down, because we'd like to get the reactions first, and then we'll come back to you pretty quickly. So please just note your questions. So when, when it's time, then you can bring them on, please. Um, uh, we have a, our next 
panelist that is going to react to what James has talked about. It's Miriam Rose Tone. Uh, Miriam is from the Netherlands, and uh, uh, I've known her for a couple of years. Um, she's an associate professor at the University of Amsterdam, Department of Geography and Urban Planning. Um, she's taken a lot of interest over the years working on what are sort of the triggers at the local level that you need to achieve landscape approaches. So she's going to talk a little bit about those entry points at the local level in reaction to this. So three to four minutes, Mia. Yeah. Thanks. Can you put the format line on so that I can respond to the issues raised by James? Yeah, so um, welcome to this panel. Um, just to, to clarify something, I'm not a landscape approach exper expert. Um, I mean, my, my interest comes from, from research on, on the interactions between governance and forest-based livelihoods. I did a lot of work on non timber forest products as a win-win strategy to find out that such win-win uh, strategies are elusive in, in, in natural forest. You either, buy, uh, you either lose on, on development outcomes, livelihood outcomes, or on conservation outcomes. So my interest shifted towards productive landscape and there started my interest in landscape approaches as an integrated approach, um, working on different issues. Um, so I'm not familiar with those big scale um, donor driven landscape approach, but rather as Peter says, my interest is in identified local level, locally embedded schemes and projects, uh, govern uh, governance, uh, schemes or private uh, sector driven schemes like value chain collaborations to s which have an impact on the landscape which have potential for to be to evolve into an integrated approach uh, for instance because they address uh, several objectives beyond the sector from which they are driven um, just to give you an example to make it concrete um, I've, I've been uh, supervising research on a reforestation scheme in Ghana, the, the modified Tonya system, uh, which is being carried out uh, between the Forestry Commission and small-scale farmers. The primary goal is to restore degraded forest reserves, but because the farmers are allowed to interplant food crops, and um, yeah, it, it has the potential to, to evolve into to an integrated approach which um, achieves uh, landscape restoration, um, food security, uh, carbon sequestration, um, etc. But it, is not, it was not developed as a landscape approach. So you need a, a, a change in mindset of, the, of, of those who are responsible for that approach to build partnerships uh, and alliances and, and to, yeah, to, 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 to get a broader scope. Well, sim the, a similar example from value chain collaboration, what we observe, for instance, in the cocoa sector um, is, is that uh, there is a business case to also invest not only in the commodity, but also in the sustainability of cocoa production in order to ensure uh, long-term uh, supply. Um, so companies start investing in, in, in farmers' livelihoods and in sustainable farming methods. Uh, so there too, have it, if, if you look at the sourcing area, you have landscape, in fact, and so th this also might be an entry point. Um, and, and this is also to emphasize that we can, as, as conservation organizations or, or civil society organizations, we can come up with a large-scale approach, and, but if it's not locally embedded, it, it will come and go with donor money and uh, not be sustainable. Um, there was so yeah that that very much aligns with James' conclusions that we need contextualized uh, approaches now about uh, monitoring and evaluation. Um, I, I think there is um, uh, a close connection to uh, participatory approaches. I mean, we heard this morning uh, in the session, which was uh, in this uh, room, about a very nice uh, trace initiative, very sophisticated method to to trace the origin of, of commodities. Um, but this kind of sophisticated methods are far away from the farmers. So I would like to argue for participatory monitoring uh, methods using participatory mapping, participatory GIS, in which farmers and, and other local stakeholders feel part of the monitoring uh, process, feel owners, uh, 
have ownership over the monitoring process uh, and, and monitoring the goals that they themselves uh, help to, to establish. And otherwise, but again, it will come and go with, with project money uh, and will not be left here embedded. Well, what else? Um, yeah, I, I was developing a, a proposal with someone from Ghana, and he came up with a nice idea. I said, we, we need to, to have a, a component to create a pool of Landscape Approach ambassadors. Uh, because Landscape Approach um, really needs a change of mindset. And, and we already heard that um, jurisdictionary boundaries really are a limit to implementing Landscape Approaches. So we, we need to collaborate <coughs> with local universities and change the curricula in order to have a course on landscape approaches, which focuses very much on collaborative leadership, on uh, uh, participatory monitoring tools, um, yeah, just to, to change the mindset of future resource managers and land managers, uh, so that they know that they, even if they come to work in a for, yeah, forestry service department or, or uh, a ministry of agriculture, that, that you change that mindset to stay within their jurisdictional boundary. Uh, I think my three, four minutes are over, right? Uh, I think the other things will pop up in further discussion. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot, Miriam. I think that, that really grounds it in the context, in terms of the context issues. Um, we'll now move on to our second uh, panelist. Um, third, who's called uh, Tony Winners. Tony is the president and director of RAF, which is a real underland paper and pulp company, uh, which is a subsidiary of April Company in Indonesia, as the famous paper and pulp company. So I think Tony is going to talk to us a little bit about how they address some of these issues in practical terms within their activities. Over to you, Tony. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very glad to be here. So, uh, James, very good presentation about the research, and uh, I'd like to see it from the private sector point of view. I mean, uh, more on the practical way that we did. Um, we, uh, April, we had an ecosystem restoration project. <coughs> it's a landscape approach in the Kampar Peninsula. <coughs> and our ecosystem restoration is basically covering 150,000 hectares and the core of the Kampar Peninsula peatland. And uh, the license is given by our government, by the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, and it's already there. So uh, I'm very interested in point three of your conclusion is the multi-level engagement and the uh, multi-stakeholder participation. Because ecosystem restoration in Indonesia, I mean, is relatively new. So, and it covers the, I mentioned 150,000 hectares. There are a lot of villages in the adjacent to the areas, and in the past, you know, it was a selective logging uh, license that we acquired and we converted to ecosystem restoration. And many of the people there made living from that forest. So what I'm trying to say here is that first is the government structure as well, because, you know, in Indonesia, the structure is this, there's a central government, there is also a provincial government, and there is a local government, the regional government. So it's three levels of governments. And, you know, sometimes or many times the central, uh, lo local and provincial have different way, different way of thinking. So this has to be synergized. You know, many of the bupatis or the, the regions in Indonesia, basically they would like to, you, you need to produce more because to, to gain more, more revenue to the state, I mean, to the, to the local government. So this kind of uh, way of thinking has to be adjusted a little bit 
So that yes, it can produce more, but not in the form of money right now, in the form of better ecosystem in the future. <coughs> better ecosystem means you, gave, you will gain a lot. So this, this participatory stakeholders uh, discussion or sitting down together with them, it's really key about success in the, uh, in the oper operational side. So for example, like we engage with the central, pro provincial, and local government, not only like said, only a tick box. One time we, we explain and then that's it. No, it has to be a very continuous. Continuous means like very regular, not only like every six months. No, it should be like every month. And not only with the local governments, it has to be also with the village heads because you know we are going to explain or explain to them that look ecosystem restoration landscape approach is key it's key for your children for you and for your uh, grandchildren as well and they make living out of the of the forest area so the challenge is that how to make uh, how to convince them that you know there are sustainable ways in in making living out of the forest like the non timber uh, forest use and also uh, fishing and etc etc also we are trying to implement also the ecotourism in those areas ecotourism so we need to provide them with alternatives if we don't provide them with alternatives of course they will reject that and if they reject that you know there's no company that can success in a community that fail so for example we also introduce this is also in regard to the landscape approaches that we introduce what we call the fire free village program uh, whereby you know we incentivize the villages if you don't have any burning at all in your area we will incentivize you certain amount of money it's ten thousand dollars in form of projects and also it's not only about the incentive i mean the, the other important thing is the alternative as well and this they will say okay if we cannot burn how do we live okay if you want to open an area as long as it's not a forest it's not forested, then we will. We will provide you with our uh, agricultural assistance. We will provide you with, we will mobilize our uh, heavy equipments and also our technician to help you to open an area. If you want to have a rice field, a 20 hectares rice field, we build it for you and it's already there. And uh, the, the uh, result was significantly, you know, the forest fire in those villages dropped significantly like from uh, 1,000 hectares in uh, two years ago to become less than 50 hectares. So again, uh, I would like to re reiterate that the uh, multi-stakeholder engagement is very important and all layers and not only horizontally but also vertically. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tony. Um, um, I think Tony really delved into one of the most crucial things, which is also part of his fifth question, which is how do you incentivize people? What are the incentives that go into this? I think you talk very critically on, on how you incentivize people. And we'll come back to that a little bit in the next. I'm sure you think a little bit more about how much more you can tell us, right? Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker um, is Margaret uh, Yuyatana from Thailand. She's from the Department of Agriculture. Um, is a senior policy and planning uh, expert in the ministry. And she, she's worked a lot on cooperation, collaboration in research, especially in the area of developing plans and, and planning landscapes. So over to you, Margaret. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak here and give you some insights on how the agriculture sector fits into the landscape uh, uh, approach, okay? I also, I represent the government sector views on, on this. And I also represent the Association of the Southeast Asian Nations, or we call it the ASEAN comprised of 10 ASEAN member states in the Southeast Asia. And uh, where we have the ASEAN common position on agricultural issues related to agriculture at the UNFCCC COP negotiations. 
which was already uh, reflected in the G77 and China common position on agricultural issues. So this, the plenary speaker this morning, it's very interesting plenary, uh, mentioned this morning that the mantra for in the agriculture are the words adaptation and mitigation. And uh, unfortunately, there was no decision on this item in the COP negotiation. However, it is not in the language in the Paris Agreement we use, but it is in our common goal that uh, to even more important with the keywords reflected in the landscape approach, which is a multifunctional integrated approach for food security, livelihood, resilience, uh, enhanced carbon sinks, all those uh, keywords. It is therefore important to have a deep analysis on how these words, adaptation and mitigation, complements one another. And uh, we hope that uh, this would be a good preparation to the Substa 46 in Bonn. Okay. Now, on the question how we really achieve climate goals, it is just simple as putting policy into action. What we want are implementation on the grounds. Okay. Particularly in Thailand, His Majesty the Great King Pumipon Atulia there applied a landscape approach in his more than 70 years in reign through his more than 4,000 royal initiative projects all over Thailand. We have to learn from his great works on promoting resilience to climate change of the rural, rural community through a scientific, evidence-based land and water resource management, forestry management, livelihood programs, and His Majesty's sufficiency economy philosophy is one model that gives the community the protection to all kinds of external shocks, be it environmental or economic shocks. Now going back to the topic, how can all the stakeholders get involved? First, we need commitment and devotion by the leaders. As I gave an example to His Majesty the King Pumipon Atulia Dead, who have worked so hard in actually going and reaching the people in the rural areas to know what are their real needs and listen to them how their life could be better. So these informations are vital, very important, and this has to be put mainstream into policies for all the line ministries of the government to get engaged. Well, as this is an order from the king, so every line agency has to respond. That is the strength of, uh, of the royal project, initiative project in Thailand, particularly. <coughs> The international cooperation is also very important on the implementation, in the implementation phase, for expertise and funding support, for technology development and transfer and capacity building of all related actors. So we partner with dialogue with the CGR centers, the UNEP, the IPRI, FAO, and many more ASEAN dialogue partners. And many more, not only on research project basis, but we are now more towards a more holistic approach. 
and through regional networks as we need to scale up and mobilize the national determined contribution identified by the ASEAN member states. What we need is to package the existing technologies right now. We have extensive research results. And what we need is to package um, a, a climate resilient technology that is really practical in every agroecological vulnerability. To conclude, speaking speci specifically on the agriculture sector, the ASEAN Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry is moving towards a more holistic approach on the whole value chain, which is more or less reflecting the landscape approach, gender responsiveness, linkage to market, capacity building. It is important that we know what we need and the vulnerabilities of a different agroecological um, uh, situation or conditions. Okay, and uh, and uh, we need to have a common goal. Our networkings, our partnerships should be going towards a common goal. And uh, we believe that networking we will have a better chance of scaling up and scaling up um, some global actions on climate change. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Margaret. Thanks a lot. I mean, your, I think your intervention touches a little bit on one of the things at the heart of the landscape approach, which is how do you bring different sectors together? You repeatedly mentioned about agriculture linking with other government departments. I think that's an extremely important question. Um, that we remind some people, I'm sure, in here have some insights to, to share with us. Um, without much ado, I think we'll go to our next uh, speaker, Paola Agustini from the World Bank. She's, uh, um, she works with the, she is a lead economist at the World Bank Environment and Natural Resources uh, uh, Practice, Global Practice Unit, and she leads the work on resilient landscapes. She had 20 years of experience around Africa and Latin America. So we'll be happy to share some of your perspectives on this. Thank you. Thanks, Paula, for being here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, so let me see what I see as uh, uh, some of the challenges or what we are, the World Bank is trying to do. So the World Bank is really now heavily involved in uh, in uh, using the landscape approach as one of the main way to really uh, implement uh, uh, the projects that we are doing with the governments uh, in different parts of the world. And uh, especially uh, on the landscape restoration part, there is a lot of interest from our client countries because of the positive message that it brings, which is not so much the land degradation side, but really the opportunities of restoring the land into a productive system for the production of, of, of uh, ecosystem services uh, for improving the livelihood of the people. As uh, an example to you of uh, you know, how much we are really using this uh, landscape approach, the World Bank has uh, approved the last year, uh, after many years of a sort of an empty um, policy document for the bank, a forest and landscape action plan <coughs> that really, um, you know, focusing on uh, on uh, on the landscape approach as the way to go for uh, for this double uh, objective, if you want, of uh, improving ecosystem services and improving livelihood. And the way the forest action plan, uh, forest and landscape action plan, is organized is that you have. Uh, what something that is what you can do, what kind of investment you can do in forest area, and I'm talking about tropical forest or dryland forest as well. So, you know, sustainable forest management, community forestry, all this work. But then it has an all another component which has, is called uh, forest smart investment. So it's all uh, the investment that maybe our investment in infrastructure, maybe our investments in uh, agriculture, or maybe our investments in transport, 
how to make sure we make them more source friendly. And that's really, in some way, one of the way to do landscape approach. And uh, so uh, here it comes, and I connect very much to uh, what my previous speaker was saying, is how do you bring in the other sectors? How do you work together with the other sector if you want to really use this landscape approach? The commitment of the bank, uh, is, so they are uh, spelled out in this uh, forest and landscape action plan, but they also reflected in documents like uh, this is uh, uh, the, the climate change, uh, uh, climate change action plan. We have a very big uh, um, part of this uh, uh, climate change action plan related to uh, to landscape and how much of a landscape can bring in in terms of the of, of climate. We are here in Morocco, but as we all know. Uh, we, you know, sort of uh, um, champion of the landscape approach. Uh, the landscape approach is much more than the climate part. Of course, the climate adaptation is fundamental. The mitigation, hopefully, will be the cherry on the cake for everybody. But there are many other reasons for uh, for using this landscape approach. Nonetheless, it's it's in there, and uh, we are really committing uh, that a big part of our investment are going to use this uh, uh, landscape approach. We have uh, some uh, uh, programs uh, you know, in, from Indonesia to Ethiopia to Costa Rica, Colombia. Um, we just finished a session this morning on the Great Green Wall and from uh, Senegal to, to Djibouti and how some countries from North Africa want to join this Great Green Wall, which should be really more of a mosaic of ecosystem and, and livelihood management. Uh, so it's really, um, it's really pe picking up and uh, all, the, um, all the challenges we find with our clients, you know, the bond challenge and uh, uh, with their uh, targets of a certain number of, uh, of uh, uh, hectares uh, uh, restored and or under uh, sustainable landscape management, it's really helping to move in this agenda. Uh, in terms of um, some of the uh, challenges that we find, uh, um, the, one of the things that is coming to us from our clients is that what they need the most is not only or not so much the, the investment. Uh, maybe money can be there even from the private sector, but it's the technical assistance. Doing uh, uh, landscape or landscape restoration is not obvious always so, so obvious. What is the best way to do it in, so that you're really uh, optimizing uh, the use of your resources? So it's a technical assistance on the technical size. It's technical assistance on looking at the trade-offs. A lot of times when we talk about landscape management, you have to manage trade-offs between different land uses. The end goal is uh, for the World Bank, it's always to do you know, reduce poverty, increase shared prosperity in a sustainable way. So it is not that it's conservation at all costs. No, we are very conscious with our, con our countries want to grow. Our countries want development. So managing these trade-offs and learning how to manage that is where they are asking us a lot of technical assistance and, and, and help. So I think that that's really the major, the major uh, a challenge that is coming from our, from our clients and uh, I hope that in terms of investment with the private sector, with uh, our uh, part of the bank that works with the private sector is called IFC, just uh, issued a fantastic bond, uh, bond for, for uh, restoration. It's so a lot of innovative financing is coming up, but uh, uh, where we all need to put our efforts is on uh, the championing and the technical assistance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, I think um, Paula makes a really, really sound point there in terms of trade off. <coughs> I'll add to that synergies between these multiple objectives that you want to bring together. I think that's extremely crucial. I think the second point she makes, which is the whole investment dimension, I think that's really important because we are moving towards blended finance uh, approaches nowadays and we need to technically understand what blended finance is about and how you bring that, that together. I think 
these two things that she mentions are really, really crucial. And we might need, I'm sure some of you will come back into it. I see some people in the room that I know are, you know, working on these things. So we, we'll come back to that. Um, but that leads me, I think when you mentioned the Great Green Wall, um, I started thinking about the scale issues. When uh, um, Tony talked about 150,000 hectares, then I started thinking, what about, what scale are we talking about? So I, I think this gives us the opportunity because we asked Dennis, to reflect a little bit about the scaling of dimensions of, of landscapes. Um, Dennis Garity is a former director general of ECRAF, but currently he is the UNFCC drylands ambassador and a senior fellow uh, resident at ECRAF. Over to you, Dennis. Great, well thank you very much, Peter. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I brought my uh, little teleprompter along this morning because like certain presidential candidates, I get off message if I don't uh, if I don't keep my notes in front of me, so I will try to do that. But um, James, uh, I'd like to make my remarks a takeoff on uh, your presentation and some of my reactions to it, which I think was part of our responsibility this morning. But I welcome that because uh, James, you started off with um, a, a very interesting question. Is a, a rose by any under, other name, is it still a rose? Ah, and you noted that integrated rural development programs of the 70s and 80s, the uh, integrated conservation development programs of the 90s and early 2000s, and then there were the uh, integrated natural resource management approaches during the 1990s that the CGIAR pioneered. Um, and now we talk about integrated landscape approaches. The, the rows, I think, you were talking about. Um, in addition, um, there were the farming systems approaches of the late 70s to the mid 90s, which were another integrated perspective of <clears throat> that, that dealt with farmscapes, if not landscapes. So you're right that there was a rich history of research and investments deploying these prior approaches. And I would also add that um, there was a, a great deal of empirical work done on uh, why uh, they were um, not as successful as you implied. So, um, and in fact, Peter, you know, I've actually been around long enough to be contemporary with much of what these, <laughs> these programs um, were back uh, when the Ford Foundation pioneered um, integrated rural development in India and other countries, et cetera. I go back quite a ways, it does remind me. But um, I was excited when you listed them and you acknowledged that history and I kicked back in my seat and I was anxiously expecting to learn how the new integrated landscape approaches uh, would differ from these preceding other approaches and to learn more about what might be, the, you know, give us confidence that integrated landscape approaches have learned from the past and are now overcoming the, um, the problems and the constraints um, that were identified uh, with respect to these other approaches and would be therefore obviously more successful than their predecessors. Ah, now that would be a very interesting analysis, but it's not one that you actually did, or at least you actually reported. Um, I gather that you didn't really attempt to answer that question of the, the historical comparison, but rather tried to determine, uh, based on contemporary projects of integrated landscape approaches, whether they were being successful according to a number of indicators. But I would advise that, you know, that historical analysis obviously would ground everything because that's what we're talking about in terms of old wine and new bottles. That's what we're talking about calling the rose by a different name. Because for those of us who have been around, that's the question that's lingering in our mind. Because all of these prior attempts were also grounded in the context of taking a more holistic, integrated approach to development in various contexts. So that's been around for a long time. The issue is, how do you do it more effectively, and particularly more cost effectively? And James, you noted that um, there are major difficulties with the current literature, gray or peer-reviewed, to try to deal with making a judgment of whether 
current uh, integrated landscape approaches are more uh, more successful, more, uh, and particularly, <coughs> are they more cost effective? And, and that's what I'd like to kind of close on, is that um, when, when you come to, you know, com uh, looking at whether uh, a, a given holistic integrated project is successful by a number of indicators, you obviously have to compare it against the straw man, which is a non-integrated approach. And where I believe that many of the prior programs have reached, um, you know, had reached situations where they were seriously criticized was that it was based on were they actually more cost effective in delivering the uh, outcomes that they were, considering that um, when you do have more siloed programs, which are the natural way, it's simpler, um, it's more direct, you need less sophisticated human capacity to, to enact them, and, um, and therefore, um, particularly in developing countries, um, I know that some of these programs have foundered because the capacity and the talent is not there to do sophisticated holistic arrangements. So I guess, uh, James, I'm not criticizing, but I'm pleading that we need to go farther and look at that historical analysis because I think it would be so rich in giving us better grounding on where we ought to be with integrated landscape uh, programs. And then finally, um, I think, uh, Peter, now that we are um, really engaged at a huge, um, a huge way in, 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 in approaching the restoration challenges that Paula brought up, um, we obviously are looking at these in a holistic, integrated process at the landscape level. Now, we, we do desperately need, don't we, these kind of analyses that give us a better idea of how we can cost effectively operate. And I know I personally um, am engaged very much, uh, along with my sister Wanjira Matai here in the audience, with um, supporting the development of the Africa 100, uh, the African Restoration Initiative, uh, which has a target of 100 million hectares. And many countries, about 21 countries, have joined. Uh, over 63.5 million hectares have been conf confirmed. But now we get to the real work, which is how do you work across uh, the environment ministry, the agriculture ministry, the livestock ministry, to develop this holistic landscape approach? So indeed, we're locked into landscape approaches. There's no doubt about it. But how do they, how do they stack up against historical experience, and how do they compare cost-effectively with other less integrated ways of doing business. That's my challenge to you and your colleagues to get to work and get us answers because we're spending lots of money and we need to know how to do it more effectively. And I tell you, many governments will be happy to know the results of that as well. Thank you for inviting me, Peter. <laughs>
and, and how do they stack up in terms of the evolution in itself. So I think it's free, the book is free, you can download it. There will be cards at the back that you can get and you download it and you begin to have questions. The only thing we couldn't answer is the performance side. And that's because a lot of the um, approaches before haven't been looking at performance. And that's what we need to begin to look at at the moment. And that's really crucial. So thanks for touching on that. Please, I know you've been extremely patient. So we'll try now to take your questions. I'll ask the panelists to come in front. Please try to be brief. We've got 25 minutes. So if you can try to keep your question to 30 seconds, that would really help. So we'll take about four or five comments or questions, and then we go back to the, to the panel. Right? Can we start, please, with this side? And then we go to the other side. Yeah? Just be patient. I've, I've, yeah. So one, two, three, yeah, and then we and then we see the next round, and then we can go. Please, can you please say your name and your your affiliation, please? Thank I'm Jonas Hein from the German Development Institute in Bonn, Germany. I have one question actually to the first uh, bullet point of the conclusion, but I think it will also be picked up um, during the different uh, comments. So the question is that I have. Our landscape approach is really under-theorized since we've just heard that actually we have a lot of experience um, on research on community-based conservation, on Red Plus, on, on all these different conservation mechanisms, especially from, from more critical researchers like political ecologists, human geographers, anthropologists. So all that knowledge is, is somewhere around actually about how power is constructed in landscapes, which actors are important, and um, so I think landscape research as such is maybe not under theorized, but the approach as such. So maybe the, we have to learn more from, from all these researchers that did actually the work already and find out the right things that we need to design such approaches. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe we pass on the mic um, to the lady at the back, please. Thanks for being very concise. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Carissa Kasperzak. I work with the National Wildlife Federation based in the US. Um, so I had part of my thinking about the idea of, of um, what's new about the landscape approach uh, is the proliferation of technology and monitoring systems. Um, you know, the new access to, or not new, but you know, proliferation of uh, satellite data, LIDAR data to help to help the um, to help facilitate landscape planning and being able to easily look at an, a landscape and, and look at the different uh, ecosystems and land uses and so I was just wondering what you all think um, of some of the tools that have um, that have, have come about like HCV HCSA you know the, the convergence um, if you guys are using tools uh, if what you've thought is helpful. Um, in your landscape planning um, in the different contexts. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Um, can we go to the gentleman at the back, please? Thank you. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Robert Hofstede. I'm Director of Climate Change at IDRC Canada. Um, I was very intrigued by this historical summary of how the concepts towards integrated research on landscape has evolved and we're still not there and if we look a little bit back then we see that every time we take something else on board 20 years ago we didn't value too much the traditional knowledge and we got it on board then we didn't value too much the participation aspect we got it on board then we didn't value too much the different skills of environment we got it on board now it's the big thing how to get private investments and we're trying to get it on board maybe to become complete, we shouldn't look too much back, but to the future, my question would be, what do you think would be the next thing we have to take on board so that we do not know yet that will be important in five years' time? Could you reflect a little bit on that? Yeah, thank you, very, very concise as well. Can we take a few more questions and then we can turn it over to the panel? Any more comments, questions? Yes. Thank you so much. Just in addition to the last uh, question, there's this term of territorial approach, uh, widely used these days, and I was wondering whether you could reflect on that. It's a rose question, I know. 
but uh, that would make our life much more easier. I'm uh, with the German government in the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Thank you. Um, with that, I think we can turn it over. Um, I know there was a specific question on Jim from Jonas uh, Hain, and then and then the other was a bit open to whoever wants to respond. Sorry, can you just remind me which question I'm responding so from, from to? From the, the first one. Jonas okay. Asked about, um, you said Knowledge is there, yeah. Yep. Right, yep. But there are several concepts from yep. geography and, and Yeah, and I think I said at the end of the presentation that you know, there's sufficient knowledge there available to us. It's now time to utilise that knowledge. And I, I do think one area that, that, is, that remains under theorised is the metrics. Like we still don't have, you know, a, a sufficient body of knowledge on metrics for landscape approaches and you know we need to bring in GIS but you know I, I think we need more than we have currently but yeah you're right we now is the time definitely to move beyond conceptualizing can you also have a tick once you have the mic on any of the questions that came from um, yeah the IDRC and, and the general government yeah also to reflect on Dennis's points that he made earlier yeah so from our perspective, how landscape approaches are different to prior interventions, certainly it's within the theory, it's acknowledging that win-wins or triple wins are not particularly likely. I think that's been the, um, the, the kind of uh, the way that previous interventions have, have um, put themselves forward. A landscape approach is about trade-offs. It's about acknowledging that there's going to be winners, there's going to be losers. It's how we develop strategies to help the people that are losing so they lose less often, basically. I think that is where the theory is distinct. Unfortunately, we can't, we can't evaluate that in practice yet. You see, there, there just aren't enough interventions that have happened where we can say if that's actually the case in practice. And they're all saying they're, they're successful. So actually, they, they are all reporting win-wins, which we know is probably not the case. <laughs> um, yeah. And the, the third question, what do we take on next? I thought that's really interesting. And there was a really nice paper that came out earlier this year, or, or very recently actually, from Jeff Sayer, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. But that looked at a landscape approach um, over the past 12 years, so 12 years of experience. And they didn't call it a landscape approach when it first started, but that's basically what it's developed into. And that's basically shown that the things that they were most concerned about 12 years ago actually aren't that important anymore. And there's things that have changed within the landscape that have, you know, have much greater influence on their decision making at the moment. So I think if we can somehow predict the things we need to take on next, and obviously that's where models come into play, then uh, that would be useful. I don't have the answers, sorry. Yes, anyone wanting to react? Yeah, I, think, I yeah, would please. like to follow up on that. Uh, yeah, surely. Um, acknowledging uh, the need for integrating, uh, integrated approaches is not really new. Um, negotiation, uh, a negotiation process, negotiation trade-offs is new. Uh, but what I think is also new, and, and that also makes the question about uh, the process a, a challenging one, is that we now recognize um, complexity and uncertainty. And that means that there is no blueprint for, for a landscape approach and for a process to implement a landscape approach. Uh, just uh, uh, had the actors in a the landscape, they changed. The dynamics of the processes changed. The economic activities changed. Just a simple example, when I did my, research, my PhD research in Brazil and Amazonia, the big issue was spontaneous colonization. And shortly after that, a uh, small-scale illegal gold mining. Uh, now, imagine implementing a landscape approach on those issues. They, they would figure prominently. When I came back to the table 50 years later, there was no gold, mining, uh, gold miner in my study area anymore because gold was depleted. The big concern was uh, the expansion of soy cultivation. So that means a different set of stakeholders, a different set of goals. Um, and so I, I, I wouldn't worry too much about sustainable institutions in the case of a landscape approach, but just, again, as I argued earlier, build on local initiatives and, and, and the topical issues and, and, and actual actual constellations in place. Okay, good. Any, any uh, and, then, and then Margaret, do you want to say something? Okay. Um, so thank you very much for the questions. So um, let me try to uh, 
to see, well, the, the, the question on the tools for monitoring. So uh, I don't remember here. So the, the World Bank uh, is uh, really trying to work with the clients and use a lot more of all this uh, uh, in, you know, incredible amount of tools related to some, some uh, that, that can help in spatial analysis. It's not easy. Many of our clients are also very confused because there are too many out there and not always bringing the same, um, uh, the same information if you want. So I think that one of the responsibility of the technical partners is to really try to uh, um, coordinate a bit more on, especially on the spatial uh, uh, one and, uh, and bring uh, uh, you know, a more consistent message to the countries. The, the policy makers don't have too much time. They want just a, you know, a map that speaks to them. And we're not yet able a lot of times to just give that uh, in, in a simple way. So we need to do more work uh, in, in getting together on that. So that's the first point. First point. On the question, what is uh, next? What, did if, uh, what, uh, what is the next issues? Um, I'm not sure if we have not considered, but uh, every time I've been coming to the Landscape Forum for the last three or four years, and I see a lot of uh, work on the natural resources, the forest, the agriculture, etc., the climate, the adaptation, the land rights. I think we are not uh, uh, there yet completely on the water. The water is not uh, so prominent in our, in our work. And uh, I had the, the, the privilege to be on a panel with Lester Brown about uh, two or three weeks ago. I'm sure many of you know him. And he was uh, uh, telling us that uh, the next big issue for him, the, the next book he's going to write, is going to be about aquifers. All these aquifers are getting completely depleted uh, in about a ratio of one to 10, which means we are extracting 10 times more than the water that is getting into the aquifer. And he gave me all the numbers, etc. Uh, so we need to integrate that element a lot more. Uh, I don't want to integrate it in five or 10 years. So let's start now. And the second point, which I think we need to work <coughs> where we just had the, uh, in the panel today, uh, Mauro Agnoletti, who just entered discussing, that is to work more on the heritage aspects of the landscape. Uh, the, the inclusion, the co-evolution, as it was mentioned, in between the human and the environment, and how to re uh, recuperate all the, 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 the cultural element and the historic elements on how the communities were really dealing with their landscape. I think it's an element that needs to be more present that brings an important livelihood aspect uh, to, to the point. The last one, uh, territorial versus landscape. We are having the same debates in the bank. And uh, the, in Latin America, they use a lot the word uh, desarrollo territorial. In uh, West Africa, the gestion de terroir. So our understanding, but it's not a matter of interpretation. So the way we interpret it in the bank is that uh, territorial approaches are bigger than the landscape one. Uh, maybe because they include more elements, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of industry, a lot of the uh, urban areas. So I'm trying inside the bank as global landscape lead to really move you know, what, from the landscape into the territorial as well, to integrate them to integrate them more so that you bring also all these other, all these other elements. But one step at a time, right? So let's start with the landscape and then in include the rest. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to comment a bit about whether or not we use the whatever available tools trying to measure and uh, other stuff. So basically, we've been working, I mean, for our 150,000 hectares ecosystem restoration, we've been working closely with the uh, Fauna Flora International, well, the Nature Conservancy as well, the national NGO, Bidara, and some other local NGOs, and of course, some other consultants. And we've been using, I mean, we're gonna use any best available technology that can help us in trying to uh, 
because the, the four approaches are the to uh, to protect first, and then to assess, and then to restore, and to manage. So all the stages will have to go in accordance with the plan, and we've been helped by by the uh, other consultants and also uh, NGOs as well. But the critical thing I mentioned earlier about the the landscape itself, because if you're talking about Kampar Peninsula, it's not only our ecosystem restoration, 150,000 hectares. You know, there's some other concessions there as well. There's also a national park in that in that peninsula. So, the key thing is the collaboration. Collaboration means that the government should be in front. I mean, yes, of course, the we the private sector would like to push, but the government has to be in front, and we will always support and follow the government because there are some national parks in those areas as well, and. Uh, and there are some other concessions as well, like, like I mentioned earlier. So again, we will use whatever available technology in trying to do the four stages. And we expect that for the bigger uh, landscape approach, we gonna rely very much on the lead of the government. Thank you very much. With uh, regards to the... Okay, uh, we are more familiar. We, we've heard uh, words such as integrated farming systems, sustainable agriculture, climate smart agriculture for a very long time. Okay, so the question, with the question of how it differs from the landscape approach we are talking right now, is from my understanding is that it, it now, uh, uh, address the, imp the issues on what's the impact of climate change on, 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 the, on the agricultural system or the agri-food system. So uh, it is important that climate change is a cross-sectoral, uh, it's a cross-sectoral issue. So, so it is very important that there should be an integrated approach or uh, I, as I understand it, that landscape approach is one of the of one uh, practice that we could uh, consider here. Um, with regards to the tools, as I already um, a bit mentioned in my talk a while ago, that what we need now is to identify all those the available uh, technologies. In a, in a specific uh, vulnerable zone or agroecological agri zone. Packaging it and, and uh, having it as an, a practical solution to, to a certain vulnerable area. Um, we, we, call it, uh, the, uh, we call it the climate smart agriculture technology packaging for, for different kind of uh, agriculture. And there we will need some tools and, and some approaches on that. With the territorial approach, um, we are trying in the ASEAN region to have a common position on, on how we will deal with the, with the impact of climate change on food security. We have a common goal. We should have a common goal uh, on, on, on uh, addressing this issue, which is food security and livelihood. And by there, we, we have a common position on how we will deal with, with, the, with climate change, or what will be our climate change action, involving all the sectors, multi-sectoral actors. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot. I, I, I really would like um, two points. I think on the tools thing, FAO developed some things in the past with that needs updating. So you can look at that. But I think there are lots of modern tools that haven't been updated on the FAO sort of tool, tool kind of toolbox. And, and they, we didn't have them to talk about it here. On the territorial thing, there is a really nice recent paper that came out in World Development uh, by somebody called Mike McCall. And I can share that with you. I can give you what the contacts. But it's a brilliant one, looking at territorial versus landscape approaches in World Development. Really good, very recent yeah. this year. So it's a really nice, nice paper. Um, Dennis, yeah, with you, one, 30 seconds? 30 seconds, okay. Yeah. If you want to go really back into history with uh, integrated approaches, back in the uh, 
20s, uh, the soil and water conservation districts yes. were formed in the United States. And that was a county level territorial yeah. approach way back then. They still exist mm -hmm. in every county in the United States. Mm -hmm. So the territorial approach has been around for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and you'll have to work on that one too, Jane. Okay. Um, there is yeah. your 30 seconds are running out. Okay, I've got That's, one more point to make. Yes, just one. To yeah. address what's new, what's the next big thing. And um, I am really excited about the fact that um, with the, um, uh, the uh, Geological Survey of the U.S. and FAO, a World Resources Institute and others, they've developed a tool called Collect Earth, which is making us possible to go into a whole new element of crowdsourcing and crowd engagement uh, in monitoring all sorts of things in the landscape at very high resolution with no cost. And um, the name of the tool is Collect Earth. We are now at, 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 at a stage when the individual in their own uh, office or home can engage in monitoring their local landscape, their community landscape, or anything bigger than that. I think this is really exciting because it's no longer the purview of those uh, pointy-headed GIS specialists who, you know, give me the data, I'll go away for six months and I'll give you a map. We now can engage in that, and it's a wonderful opportunity for us to, to, to do this. Uh, and, and that leads to the big opportunity for all of us to get engaged in evergreening the planet. Because whatever we do as individuals, we want to monitor what we do and see the outcomes. So, Peter, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot, Dennis. Thanks. Um, um, that's a very enthusiastic note. I, I like, we can't take questions back and forth. But what I'd like to happen now is if you felt that there is something really important that we've missed in the discussion that you want to highlight or a comment, please have the microphone. And, and make your point in 30 seconds. We'd like to go around, just some comments and some, some you know, if, if you feel that there is something that is really missing that we need to highlight before we, we close it. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I, Percy Summers from Conservation International in Peru. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more about scaling up. Mm. I think a lot of the landscape efforts are still done at a very small scale. And I think that's one of the issues with monitoring and measuring success because we can have this first phase where we do the spatial analysis, where are the key areas to conserve, where we want to target uh, more efficient uh, activities. But if I can only reach 1,000 farmers and I have 30,000 farmers in the landscape, my impact is still not going to be landscape scale. It's still going to be project scale. Yeah. So OK, good. Any other observations, comments, please? Okay, I think people are pretty, pretty, f have the feeling that we've ex exhausted a lot of things. I think um, they, they've really been, been really, really good in looking at, at what we wanted. I think they've raised a lot of the issues. We've gotten some issues back. I, I think we are moving towards, and I think we're asking the right questions here. At the end of it, asking what is new, I think is a really hard question we have to, we have to look at. And I think they've provided quite a lot of perspectives on that. I think um, just one from my side, I think the big question about what is new and in terms of the metrics, I think one of the most important questions is not whether we have metrics for measuring, as Dennis said. I think the biggest question is how do we measure in an effective and efficient way? How do we take a minimum set of indicators? Because there are lots of indicators of sustainability out there. But what is a minimum set of indicators that gives you a good feeling of the landscape moving forward and measuring what is necessary at reasonable cost? Because that, that's, that's where I think, because we are moving towards questioning performance of the landscapes on climate change, on different issues. That's an extremely important question we are exploring now. And I think one of the issues that I think you raised, which is coming on and on and on, is how do you nest these different levels? I think your point about really looking at, at that, I think the nesting of the different levels is extremely important here. I think if, we, if there are two challenges we want to go back with is how do we become more efficient 
in landscape approaches. Your question about the, the uh, uh, too many frameworks existing, I would say in our thinking now, one of the big questions that remain open is, how do you bring these multiple concepts from water, from forestry, from agriculture, into a framework that allows them to be implemented in synergy and that you minimize the trade-offs? What's that framework? Because as you said, there are lots of things everywhere. James mentioned you've got all of these things. And a lot of them, as you said, you know, the water question, we had integrated you know, water management as a huge landscape concept. How do you bring a framework that brings these things together and that allows synergy and, 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 and sort of seamless implementation at that sort of convenient level, whether you want to call it territory, which brings in the jurisdiction and decision-making side of the story, right? I think this is, these are some of the messages, as, as I can summarize, that we are moving towards. How do we become more efficient? How do we make landscape approaches more performance-based, questioning whether they are delivering value for money? I think that's, that's an extremely important question, because the whole financing thing is hanging over our heads. And nobody will invest if they don't get value, value for money. And the tools that you mentioned are really important in making sure we give that value for money, I think, is really important. So I think, let's give our panelists a big hand for <laughs> Thank you very much for, for, for being here and for participating.